The TV Workshop Series is produced by students enrolled in the telecasting program at Milwaukee Area Technical College. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. Zing, zing, zing went my heartstrings. From the moment I saw him, I fell. Chug, chug, chug went the motor. Bump, bump, bump went the brake. Thump, thump, thump went my heartstrings. When he smiled, I could feel a car shake. He tipped his hat and took a seat. He said he hoped he hadn't stepped upon my feet. He asked my name, I held my breath. I couldn't speak because he scared me half to death. Good evening and welcome to TMERNL, the Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light Company. Tonight we're going to take a nostalgic look back to the days when trolleys still rove the streets of Milwaukee. With me tonight, we have some members of the East Troy Trolley Museum and the Wisconsin Electric Railway Society, Historical Society. My name is Fran Dietz, and with me tonight are Bill Nedden, who is president of the Society and the East Troy Trolley Museum, Don Miller, who is the Society Archivist, and Bob Klenke, who is the Public Relations Manager for the East Troy Trolley Museum. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, tell me, when was the first time when uh, trolleys were introduced to the streets of Milwaukee? Well, electric trolleys don't start rolling in Milwaukee until April of 1890, but we should allow for the fact that there were horse cars in the city of Milwaukee running on East, what's now Water Street, as far back as the Civil War, so we've had them around for an awful long time. So 1890 is when the electric... First electric street cars came in, right. Now, horse cars only lasted until 1894, but Electric cars got rolling in 1890, and this was one. We were one of the first cities to really get going with electric streetcars. What kind of a reaction did the public have to the introduction of the electric railway? Was it substantially different, and you know, was there a public reaction to it? Well, it's funny. You look at some of the the articles in the Milwaukee Sentinel, which of course is still published, and it talks about people almost being paralyzed with fright because they were afraid that the electricity and the wires is going to start running down the poles and go through the rails and, and electrify horses and everything like that. So that, you know, most people, as with new things, they'll accept it, but uh, some people were quite afraid of it. Um, electricity was introduced in the home then. Uh, was it electricity, per se, that scared them, or the fast movement, or what seemed to be the focal point of, the, of their fear of trolleys? The, um if there was a reaction like this in Milwaukee, it was due to the fact that things changed overnight. There had been electric lights on the streets, uh -huh. experimental stations, but the uh, city, the entire city was electrified virtually in the space of about 12 months. This was a national experiment, by the way. Electricity was being used in other cities, but this was the first time that an effort was being made to take an entire city and take all of its resources, street transportation, lighting, and the like, and convert them into uh, electrical power or something that was generated by electricity. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to think that this experiment, the electricity experiment, is an ongoing one as we have now come to appreciate uh, as we as a society are evaluating our energy resources. So the experiment began in Milwaukee in approximately April of 1890, the electricity experiment. I see. Well, how, um, knowing this was the public's reaction, how responsive were they to using the trolleys as a means of transportation then? Beautifully so. Oh, definitely, because you'll find that the streetcar, this is of course before the automobile really got rolling, the streetcar became the way for everybody to travel. It was something that, uh, you know, you didn't have to be rich to afford. If you could afford a nickel for a fare, you were in. Uh, the uh, the streetcar system spread all over the city. And of course, there were inner urban lines that went to surrounding communities, and it, become, it became extremely popular. And it, did, it did have a little hurdle to go over at first, though, didn't it? Well, you know, there are problems. There are public acceptance of, of a new form of uh, a vehicle, of course. And then, uh, Don, you mentioned the, the 1896 strike was quite a problem, too. 
Well, it was, but that was a kind of a political issue. Before we move on to this subject, though, I'd like to ask Bob. Bob, you mentioned uh, the other day, as we were talking about this, that this was a, um, a great conveyor belt. That's, well, that's right. It's sort of interesting that when you look at, uh, look at the point that the, uh, the trolleys were a very first simple form of automation because once the trolleys were put on the rails and the rails were channeled, the, the trolley virtually steered itself. It had its mm -hmm. own mode of power. It was actually a, a conveyor belt of a human conveyance, and it was really one of the first forms of automation. Was it used for other things than transporting people then? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, the TMERNL got into uh, freight operations, uh, hauling uh, various materials, uh, LTL freight, uh, even uh, carload freight, I believe, uh, all sorts of forms. Uh, their main conveyance was, was passengers, but uh, they did get into other... Parties, uh, for example, the party cars that are uh, <laughs> being viewed right now uh, with the Marguerite. Um, People would um, get into these cars with piano, possibly even a, a beer bar, and they'd travel all over the city. The, uh, the cars were uh, illuminated with gaily uh, colored lighting, and uh, you could go all over the city and suburbs, and sometimes you know, quite some miles, um, and spend a nice warm summer evening having a party outdoors. Or, uh, as we can talk about it a little bit later, funerals could be conducted on the streetcar lines. In other words, the streetcar line was the primary transportation um, heartbeat circulation of the of the mm -hmm. community and was used then for multiple reasons. You have to remember that at, at that time, turn of the century and so forth, the automobiles were a rich man's toy and, uh, and also during the depression uh, reliance of the average public uh, fell upon the trolleys for transportation for not only going to work but even uh, uh, leisure travel uh, to and from the beach, uh, the parks, and so forth. So it was really a way of life. And another point that should be made is the fact that the electric streetcar compared to previous transportation like the horse car was so much faster mm -hmm. that you could afford to really expand the city much farther than it had been before. And someone living, say, three or four miles out on Wall Street could now comfortably commute into a job, whereas before it just wouldn't work out. As a matter of fact, uh, at the time that the line was, the last remnants of the line uh, were brought down, uh, you could travel on the trolleys, the rapid transits in this city, far faster than you can travel now even on the freeways in your automobile. That's very believable, <laughs> especially at rush hour. <laughs> right, definitely. <laughs> at any time of the day. The story about, or the, the thing you mentioned with the funerals fascinates me. Was the funeral actually conducted on the streetcar, or did they just take the coffin and conduct it to the cemetery? Or? Well, a, a funeral would be uh, conducted around the car, as oh. we can see there. The, uh, the car itself was used as the conveyance for the funeral party, but uh, there was provision, uh, as you can see, for the, uh, for the coffin to be carried in the car and all the flowers and the funeral party. Mm, and the, uh, since the lines uh, went all over the city, there were any number of cemeteries, the uh, Forest Home Cemetery in particular, where the uh, cars could go up to the cemetery and then the funeral procession would proceed right into the cemetery. Were there any other special cars that were uh, used for special purposes? Well, for one thing, you've got uh, the so-called hospital car, which started out in the 1890s as the private car for the president of the corporation. And it turned out that what, we, what, the, what the company's idea was was, in effect, like Bob has talked about before. It's kind of like um, having an ambulance brought to the person who was sick rather than bringing him to the hospital. And the purpose of the car, you can see here, it's very, very elaborate. It's very, very beautiful. It's converted into a hospital car in later years. And as we said, the idea was to bring hospital services to the injured person. The car itself survives today uh, on the northwest side of Milwaukee as a storage shed. Which, incidentally, we're trying to recover and uh, look for sponsors to restore the car in the original condition that we just saw on the screen. Uh -huh. That car at one time was the most famous streetcar in the United States. Oh, was, was it uh, rare to have such a, a vehicle, or was it just that it was so well put together? It, it, was, it was rare to have a private vehicle, and under the circumstances, <coughs> since the, the great 
electrification experiment was being conducted here in Milwaukee. The idea of the, of the uh, central station, a single station, a single company, operating uh, all the transportation facilities, generating all of the electricity for a, for a region and not just the city, was that experiment was done right here, began, begun right here, and continues uh, to be conducted here in this community. This is why our company, the electric company, is a national leader in its field and always has been. So that when the president's car of this particular concern um, is of issue, then it was a very, very special car. I see. Takes on special significance. That's right. Then. Um, I have listed here uh, called a car called the J.I. Beggs car. This is kind of an interesting car. It starts out in 1904, and it was built for John I. Beggs, who was president of the company at that time. It was a very, very elaborate car. You could spend about five minutes listing all the special features it had and inlaid mahogany woodwork and all this sort of thing. But the car burns in 1907 in a fire at the Farwell Car Barn, which is now the site of the course of the Oriental Theater. And the thing sat around for a couple of years. They built it into the funeral car that we saw pictures of a couple of minutes ago. And naturally, uh, the company is, well, like we are in Milwaukee, of course, very thrifty. When the time came that funeral <laughs> cars were, were not needed anymore, well, of course, we're going to convert it into a parlor car for the interurban system. And the thing lasted until at least the 1930s. So is they it got still a lot in of existence no. now? No. But they got a lot of mileage out of the thing. I guess so. <laughs> we probably could tell you where to find the car, but that would be an involved process. It oh. probably still exists, but exists oh, in the see. quarry under a lot of water. Oh, well, okay, let's not get into that then. <laughs> um, basically, as a means of transportation, how safe was it uh, to proceed on the trolley? Extremely safe. Uh, the, uh, the system in Milwaukee, the streetcar system, was had it as just an immaculate safety record. As a matter of fact, uh, until from, I would say, the last fatality was in about 1895. And from then until the last trolley operated on the Wall Street line in March 2nd in 1958, there was not one single fatality in the Milwaukee system. Well, what about the well-reputed Wall Street viaduct? I heard that, I understand that that was a pretty shaky situation. And people used to say prayers every time the trolley went over it. Uh, well, that's kind of exaggerated because, you know, in all the years that that viaduct existed, and I don't think there's, there's hardly a person in the city of Milwaukee who hasn't ridden over that thing at one time or another, I think all that ever happened, of, of anything serious or not, was a derailment, and that's all. There was no, you, you get stories of, you know, people think the car is going to go out there and fall thousands of feet into this, this crevice down there, and it just didn't happen that way. I think uh, we're seeing some film now. Oh, okay. right. Yeah. Fran, when the viaduct was first opened up as Myers Marble in 1892, they used to have a, um, a, a man walk in front of the train whenever the train would go over. And they started out with the little steam dummy trains, a picture that we just saw a few seconds ago. And they were so worried because the, the viaduct was so high up, and it was over 2,000 feet long, and it was an architectural wonder. It truly was, considering when it was built. And as Bill mentioned, that was probably one of the most reliable, sturdy bridges ever built. I and see. So it's more a reputation than an actual fact. It was a thrill. Right? It was a thrill to go across that viaduct <laughs> on that rock. It added streetcar. excitement. Huh? Sure. It was the best roller coaster ride in Milwaukee for the price at the time. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So. Um, then we could safely say that the Milwaukee Electric Railway Company had a, a very good record. Extremely good. If, uh, for example, you just compare it to the recent uh, LREC in Chicago, where there were, I believe, 11 fatalities, uh, Milwaukee had nothing of this nature at all. Uh, uh, they had equipment that was very, very well built and had uh, personnel that was trained very properly and, and just had an excellent company. There never was a fatality. Not, Never, not even one. Not, not, not That's one. That's amazing. Not under the uh, company's um, direct ownership. I see. Little companies on the side that preceded, uh -huh. or that they bought up may have had, uh, or if they sold off something uh, at the very end, and some smaller company came in and took a portion of the line or something like that. But the main company. Main concern. The TMR and L Company, the Wisconsin Electric Power Company, never had a fatality. Never won it. That's a that's a fantastic record. As Bob there. mentioned, not only is it the safest form of transportation, as Bob mentioned it much earlier, but.
but uh, it was safer riding a streetcar than being in your own bathtub. Yeah. In household fact, accidents. Right, there. you compare the Wall Street Viaduct. You were safer riding on the Wall Street Viaduct than you are driving your car today. Now maybe okay. that's not saying very much, but really the streetcar was safe, it got you there, there were no accidents, and people think nothing of driving in their automobile today with, with the, the possibilities of accidents are frightful, really. Well, what happened that they went out then? I mean, what, what brought on the end to trolley cars? Well, basically it's the automobile because People, you know, once they're given the opportunity to go where they want, when they want, without having to conform to a schedule, without having to walk to a route to wait for a specific car, this is a tremendous advantage. And the minute that people were able to get the automobile, even during the Depression, they would sacrifice anything they had in their household to buy gasoline for the family car, they're going to do it. And really, when you talk about the decline of the streetcar, it's really the decline of public transit because so many more people are going around in their private automobiles today than are riding today's buses. So really it's the automobile that killed them. I see. Um, was there any comfort problem, for example, in a very cold winter, thinking of the comfort of your automobile compared to getting into a trolley that, were they open in the beginning or some were they always enclosed? In the wintertime, of course, they'd be enclosed. What they used to do is they used to take the body, like kind of like a Model T Ford, you take the body off the chassis and change bodies. In the summertime, they put an open body on the chassis, and in the wintertime, they put a closed body on. The uh, platforms in the front where the uh, driver or the motorman later, when the cars were electrified, stood, were at first open. And what happened in this particular situation we're seeing here is that in, 18, in February of 1895, a trolley car went off uh, Kinnikinnick Avenue through an open bridge down into the, uh, through the ice into the Kinnikinnick River. And this was because it was 14 below zero that particular day, and the motorman was out there for, he used to work 10, 12 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. And he was out there by himself um, in the cold uh, on an open platform. Well, as a result of that wreck, and that was not the, the company we're talking about, that was not TMER and okay. that was a, a predecessor company. As a result of that wreck, the state legislator passed a law that said that all cars would have to be enclosed. Shortly after that, of course, the cars were electrified in their heat, and uh, so it was extremely comfortable riding a trolley car. In fact, if, if you were going to be stranded in the wintertime, the place to be stranded was in a trolley car. It had I heat. see. Had heat, uh, even had the built-in luxury of screens in the windows in the summer, which uh, you don't have on the buses today. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, one of the special winter memories, since we're talking about winter, um, was the Schuster's Parade. Could you uh, give us some information on that? Well, the Schuster's Parade was something that started back in the late 1920s as a promotional event for the old Schuster's department stores, which everybody will remember. They, of course, were purchased by Gimbel's in 1961. And the purpose of the parade was, you know, to draw attention to the fact that Schuster's did have the big Christmas sales coming up. There was radio promotion with uh, Billy the Brownie and all the various characters associated with that. And the whole idea of the parade was to take various pieces of work equipment, and you can see pictures of it here, cover it up as floats, and they had uh, Santa Claus and Metech the Eskimo. In earlier years, there were live reindeer. In later years, of course, they just used fake reindeer. But, you know, for a child, now I remember this parade as a child, and it was a tremendous event. You looked forward to it every year. It would start at 38th and Valide at the company shops and go east on Valide Street and then use various routes. It was a tremendous promotional device. The last one that was used as a rail parade was 1955, and we just haven't had anything like it since. This was the equivalent of the, the great Schlitz Circus Parades in Milwaukee at Christmas time. Now it looks very colorful. And who um, would Gimbel's, or excuse me, Schuster's, would they be the ones who would be responsible for preparing the, the train, or did, was it a joint effort? Well, you know, it's a joint effort between, at that time, the transport company and Schuster's because they would have their carpenters, their painters, their electricians come in. They would use company equipment, of course, and you had to have company personnel to operate the cars and make sure that uh, switches are going to be thrown and everything like that. But it was certainly a joint effort between both Schuster's and the transport company. And a lot, a lot of people who thoroughly enjoyed, you know, the parade came out. Um, other than the automobile, is there any other factor that you think played into the decline of the trolley or 
Because there are cities where the trolley is still a very popular means of transportation, Boston, San Francisco, to name two that I know. Probably the Great Depression helped very considerably. Uh, at that time, Milwaukee was being electrified um, throughout private access ways. In other words, they were laying in high-speed electric transportation, interurban or rapid transit, as, the, as they called it. And the uh, Great Depression really wiped out uh, that effort to lay in an entire network of high-speed trains, much the same way that uh, Comparable and yet somewhat different conditions have halted our own freeway construction in a community like this. There's, there's a certain parallel that, there. I see. And another factor you have to take into account, too, is that when you have a streetcar system, you have a tremendous amount of physical plant that has to be maintained. You have to maintain the track. You, in most instances, you had a franchise agreement with the city for maintaining the pavement that the track was set in. You also had to maintain the overhead wire, which is frightfully expensive. Once the electric company sold off the transportation part of its business, you had to buy power from the electric company. So just running the physical plant necessary for a streetcar is very expensive. Bill, what's happening there now? On the, on the okay, now what you're looking at there, this shows you another problem you run into. This is on 3rd Street, just below Schuster's, below Garfield. And it shows what happens when you have a power line or a derailment on the system. It ties your, your, your system up. A bus can go around, but a streetcar is stuck. It's got to stay on the tracks. The streetcar in the streets was difficult. The streetcar off the streets in its own private right-of-way was uh, very efficient and very effective. Rapid transit. What, um, what special effort was made uh, when you made your last trolley run? That must have been quite a day. Well, what was that like? That was something else. It started at 1.30 in the morning on Sunday, March 2nd, 1958. It was probably one of the coldest days of the year. And so many people showed up for the last run that they had two cars to handle the last run. Gordon Hinckley was there doing a radio interview for Monitor. There were uh, some newspaper photographers. And as the car started rolling west on Well Street, we started helping ourselves to anything on the car that could possibly be lifted off. The, the motorman. Souvenirs. Oh, yes, of course. Now, the motorman, you know, normally he has a nice seat cushion to sit on. Well, that got swiped out from underneath him. The destination sign came out, light, light uh, globes, seat cushions, buzzers, everything we could help ourselves to. Now, naturally, when they had the last trolley bus run in 1965, they had a policeman along to make sure nothing like that would happen again. They very were wise. large policemen. Yeah. Very, very ferocious <laughs> <Yes>. policemen. <laughs> not that people were not welcome to these objects. It, just, you know, it would be just a little bit distracting to have the car stripped out while it's still moving along. <laughs> to make for difficult driving, yes. You could right. do that to a streetcar, but it would be difficult to do that to a bus. To a bus, uh-huh. Well, now we can see some preserved, um, and you do run trolleys over at the East Troy Trolley Museum. Mm -hmm. How did the trolley museum begin? Or did it begin the day everybody started taking everything off the one that was going down the street? Put all the pieces. Right, all everybody together. took all their pieces and right. uh, brought them in. Well, the uh, trolley museum is an offshoot of the Wisconsin Electric Railway Historical Society, which uh, was founded uh, 10 years ago, 1967, and started as a branch of the Well Street Traction uh, branch of the Mid-Continent uh, Museum. And uh, we now have our own operating trolley museum in East Troy, Wisconsin, and have much to offer. Uh, on the screen now, you'll see a picture of a three-car North Shore train. May add that we have the longest trolley ride, trolley museum ride in the country, a 10-mile round trip. And there's a lot to see out there. You can ride on a trolley, look at equipment. Uh, we have historical displays in our depot and uh, work equipment and so forth. And there's a lot to see. and. Uh, there's a nice old-fashioned ice cream parlor right next to the depot, and uh, uh, there's a lot of, lot of nice things to see. And it's in a nice area. It's surrounded by Beulah Lake and Phantom Lake. So really, for a family gathering, you can spend an entire afternoon and have a very nice time. Milwaukee is blessed, in a real sense, with having some of the most unique museums of this type in its region here. You could go out. Uh, uh, with your family and go to any number of comparable live types of museums like this, you know. And I think that uh, the East Troy Trolley Museum is probably one of the most unique for some of the reasons that um, Bob gave. 
it's, a, it's an extremely scenic and very rustic ride as you're passing through lakes. And, uh, I've been out there. It's a very, very mm -hmm. nice afternoon. Right. Uh, you were talking before about restoring some of the old cars. What does that cost? You know, to restore a car fully. A I, lot of sweat. Lots of More dollars. Lot I, of sweat. I can see lots of dollars in my mind. Well, you know, I'll, it's surprising. Um, in some museums, and there are something like two dozen similar museums in the country, you find it's not really a question of dollars so much as just plain work. A lot of times you'll find that a car will take three years of work, and it's mostly weekends, sometimes it's take-home projects and everything like that. But in a lot of instances, except for major projects, like maybe you have to put new wheels on a car or the frame has to be strengthened, money is not the main problem. As you have people who are willing to do this on a donated basis. They're, they volunteer oh, yes. their work uh, and oh, everything. Oh, highly right? talented people, and it takes a lot of talent. But, but more even than that, just plain hard work. Yeah, just hard work. So you're working on restoring, restoring the funeral car now. Is that what you were saying before? No, we no? were hoping to get oh, a I private see. car. Uh -huh. which in its last installment was the hospital car for the city. It was like the first um, uh, paramedic unit going out. Right, emergency, early right. emergency. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And this car we are negotiating to acquire and then hoping to make arrangements. It needs, it's a wooden car and it needs a lot of tender loving care from cabinet makers, carpenters, cabinet makers. Are most of the cars wooden that you have or do you have steel or? You know? Both. We have both. 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 Yeah. No plastic. No, <laughs> well, that's very reassuring, <laughs> believe me. Um, so, is that the only one you're working on restoring right now, or no, or no getting a hold of, or? We're negotiating to get the private car, mm -hmm. right? We're also right now we're uh, restoring another North Shore car, which we hope to have on the line this year, which will bring our North Shore fleet up to four operating cars, which uh, people can ride on every weekend throughout the summer, from May through October, I may add. Okay, you want to give your location one more time so sure. people can uh, get We're an idea We're located of that? in East Troy, Wisconsin, and the easiest way to get there from Milwaukee is out the Rock Freeway, which is Highway 15, and you can get off at the uh, Route Highway 20 exit in, in East Troy. And you can board either in East Troy or Phantom Woods, which is right next to the Elegant Farmer out in McGuanago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening, gentlemen, and I certainly hope that some of our viewers out there will go out and visit your museum. It sounds delightful. Thank you. The TV Workshop Series is produced by students enrolled in the telecasting program at Milwaukee Area Technical College. went the trolley, ding, 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 went the bell, zing, 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 went my heartstrings, from the moment I saw him I fell, chug, 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 went the motor, bump, 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 went the brake, thump, 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 went my heartstrings, when he smiled I could feel a car shake. He tipped his hat and took a seat. He said he hoped he hadn't stepped upon my feet. He asked my name, I held my breath. I couldn't speak because he scared me half to death. Buzz, buzz, buzz went the buzzer. Plop, plop, plop went the wheels. Stop, stop, stop went my heartstrings. As he started to go, then I started to know how it feels.